Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started as it's right at 1.30. We always have a, a number of people just hop on in these first few minutes. Um, so thank you for joining us today. Just a quick introduction. Um, first and foremost, I want to apologize for any confusion last month. Uh, with our SISMA call. Um, we did not have a SISMA call in February. Um, it was canceled in lieu of the many, many webinars going on for National Invasive Species Awareness Week. And while that did go out in email form, uh, couched in some emails regarding National Invasive Species Awareness Week, um, I realized that I did not get the website updated. So there was some confusion and some people hopped on. Um, and it sounds like there was a, a discussion about what you guys were doing for NISA, which is great. Um, but again, I'm very sorry for any confusion. Um, and glad to be back with you guys all this month of uh, March. Who knows what month it is anymore. Um, so again, thanks for joining us today. We have a really um, great program. Um, I'm super happy to have with us um, Sarah Funk with the FWC Non-Native Animals Program um, to kind of, kind of provide an overview of that program and some updates. Um, there's, as many of you may have seen, there's some news around this regarding um, some new rules and regulations, uh, especially related to invasive reptiles in Florida. So really excited to be getting that update. Um, we've also got a, a lot going on with FISP and SISMA, um, so we'll share some of that news as well. Um, but with that, let's get straight to our uh, feature presentation today. So Sarah, I'm going to um, uh, unshare my screen and turn it right on over to you. Awesome, thank you. Bear with me here just one second as I get set up. Okay, how does that look? Looks good. All right, great. Well, thank you, Emily, and thank you everyone for the opportunity to speak with you all today about Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission's non-native fish and wildlife program. Uh, my name is Sarah Funk and I am the program coordinator, coordinator for this group. It's basically a team of biologists that function across the state to minimize adverse impact from non-native and invasive fish and wildlife issues. So I'm going to dive into a little bit of detail on what exactly we do, highlighting some of the cool or recent stuff that's in the works. And then at the end of our presentation today, going to describe some of the recent regulatory changes that pertain to some high risk reptile species. So just quick broad brush overview. This is not news to this group, but we've had over 100,000 observations of non-native fish and wildlife from across the state. And you can see each of those points represented on this map here. So this really truly is a statewide issue, though a lot of focus for animals anyway, tends to be in South and Southwest Florida. Now these 100 and over 100,000 observations represent about 500 different species. And we believe that at this time we have a close to 139 that are established or reproducing. And so like I mentioned, our program is charged with determining which of those species may become established and may negatively impact Florida's ecology, our economy, or even human health and safety. Uh, most of Florida's invasive species become established after they are either escaped or illegally released from captivity, even though it's not legal to do that. So we have one of the most challenging invasive species problems in the nation, particularly with non-native reptiles and other tropical animals. Many of these introductions, unfortunately, are due to the live animal trade. And Florida is particularly susceptible because of our subtropical climate and habitat that is conducive to the establishment of many species. We have multiple ports of entry and pathways for introduction. And of course, we are one of the centers for wildlife trade in the nation. So ultimately our goal is to protect our native uh, natural resources and the habitats that they require by ensuring that high risk invasive species are not able to become established or cause that negative impact. I'm sure you're all also very familiar with this graphic, but I love it, so I had to throw it in here. Uh, the slide illustrates the invasion curve, and as more area becomes infested with a harmful invasive species, the less likely it will be eradicated. Ultimately, control costs go up over time. 
And this is something that our team uses frequently to really assess where we are with a species and what type of management strategies are, are best to um, mitigate those adverse impacts. So clearly prevention is the key here. And once invasion has occurred, the ecological and economic cost to the state is incredibly high. Our team employs a variety of control and management strategies. And again, that includes prevention, early detection, rapid response, and even long-term control and management projects, which I will get into next. So first I wanna start with risk determination. We use a risk screening tool to determine potential risk of non-native fish and wildlife. And we've been using this more in the very recent past, especially with our most recent rule package that we've pushed forward. The level of risk for a species is based on biological factors, many of which you can see listed here. Um, how that species may interact with Florida's environment, the climate match, available suitable habitat in the state, and these tools provide scientifically sound guidance for land managers uh, on non-native species that may pose a risk to the state. We use a program called Climatch that compares climate information between a species native range and its introduced range. And we also look at habitat suitability models that are either available in the literature or that we run ourselves using a program called Maxent. So ultimately, after you put all the relevant data into this tool, the risk screening tool provides managers with an invasion score and a feasibility of control score that ultimately determines in the middle of your screen what level of risk a species may pose. And you can see here, those levels of risk range from very high to negligible. So the risk screening tool ultimately does not make decisions for land managers, but it helps to inform our science-based decision-making process when we figure out what to do next. So I wanna use tegus as an example. Uh, we recently ran Argentine black and white tegus through this risk screening tool. Again, with um, just wanted to throw a shout out there to the University of Florida who helped us develop that tool. And the outcome indicated that tegus pose a very high risk to the state. For those of you who are familiar with tegus, that's probably no surprise. This species is native to South America. It was first documented in Florida in 2002 and it came here via the pet trade. They have since become established in four counties in Florida, including Miami-Dade, Hillsboro, Charlotte, and St. Lucie County. And you can see those four population centers in the middle of your screen on that map where those red squares are located. And you can see the rest of those yellow dots are additional TEGU reports that have been confirmed or uh, verified by our staff or our partners. Uh, we just do not have any reason to believe at this time that there are breeding populations associated with all of those points. So again, likely escaped or released captive animals. So this species has a broad diet. They're known to consume fruits, vegetables, eggs, and even small mammals. And they have been documented consuming alligator eggs and threaten gopher tortoise hatchlings. They also compete with gopher tortoises for burrow space and can overwinter um, allowing them to expand far beyond Florida's uh, borders. Their native range has a strong climate match and habitat suitability models for this species indicate another strong match for the state. The image on the right is actually a habitat suitability model for tegus by Darnovich et al. from 2018, in which the darker colors that are circled here uh, correspond to areas that are more likely to have suitable habitat for this species. The results of this peer-reviewed research indicate that tegus have the potential to spread not just across Florida, but across much of the southeastern United States. And in fact, several other states, including South Carolina and Georgia, have seen tegus in the wild and are now believed to be reproducing in Georgia. So like I mentioned, our staff have been working on a rule package and the risk screen process is one of the first steps in developing that. So I wanted to just highlight this here. We put risk screen summary results. So it's like a two page PDF document that you can see on our website. The link is listed here. And we created these documents for those high risk non-native reptiles that were part of our most recent rule package in case you're interested to see what those look like. 
And as I mentioned, of course, one prevention strategy that our team does employ to minimize adverse impacts from invasive species is through regulation. Our agency does have constitutional authority to develop rules pertaining to fish and wildlife resources. And the non-native fish and wildlife rule chapter is listed here, 68-5 in Florida Administrative Code. It covers a whole variety of things that I'm not gonna dive into too much in great detail, but I did wanna point out that it defines what a conditional and what a prohibited species are. We'll dive into that next. So non-native animals that are regulated as conditional species are illegal to possess for personal use, so you can't have them as pets, but they can be imported, possessed or bred for commercial sales, public exhibition or research with a permit from the FWC. Permit holders must meet biosecurity measures that prevent escape and pass inspections of their facilities. Many conditional species are indeed freshwater aquatic species like the freshwater stingray and the red-eared slider that you see here. Non-native animals that are regulated as prohibited species are not allowed to be kept as pets or for commercial import export business. These species can be possessed for exhibition or research, again, with a permit from the state, but some species have additional restrictions like the piranha, which may not be possessed by anyone at any time. Again, permit holders must meet stringent biosecurity measures that prevent escape and pass inspections. Another preventative strategy that our agency employs is the exotic pet amnesty program. And this program is incredibly popular, provides a legal alternative to releasing unwanted pets into the wild. So the pet owner can surrender their pet with no questions asked and we facilitate finding that animal a new home through one of our pre-approved adopters. And right now we have close to 800 approved adopters in our system. Always looking for more, just gonna throw that out there. Each adopter goes through a screening process, an application process to ensure that they are knowledgeable, they have the appropriate equipment and are in where it's necessary permitted for the taxa that they are interested in adopting. We've received over 6,000 surrendered pets through this program and we offer this service year round through our exotic species hotline. And of course at our special exotic pet amnesty days that on a normal year without COVID are held a few times each year at different locations across the state. However, when animals are introduced into Florida, we rely on public and partner reports of their non-native fish and wildlife observations. Our staff operate, again, the exotic species hotline, also the 888, I've got one hotline, during normal business hours and coordinate rapid response as appropriate for what we consider high priority species. Things like tegus, pythons are, are a few examples. The public can report their observations through the hotline, through the smartphone, app or the website, all of which have the same name. Websites also known as EdMaps, I'm sure this group knows that. Uh, FWC does ask reporters to take a clear photograph and submit that with their report as well as GPS coordinates so we know exactly where the observation occurred and those photographs will help us confirm ID of the species. And during 2020, you can see in this pie chart, it's a little bit funky, sorry about that. Uh, we received over 1800 calls through the hotline and almost a quarter of those calls pertained just to iguanas. About half of the calls were about non-native lizards in general. So that's gonna loop in tegus, monitors, and other small lizards. And I wanted to share this bar graph with you all as well. This just shows the number of calls we get to the hotline um, since it began back in 2011. And you can see over the years, generally speaking, it has increased. Uh, that's probably in part because as population expands, both for people and exotic species, they're getting more and more interactions. So people are calling. We're getting the word out about the hotline as well. So people are, are becoming more and more aware that this is a service that the state offers. Um, Alan is our exotic species hotline operator. He's up there in your top left corner. So say hi to Alan. And you're probably wondering, well, why is there this big spike in 2017? That is in part because that's when New Guinea flatworms were really blowing up in the media and everybody and their brother thought, oh my gosh, if I see a flatworm, the end is near. So we had a lot of really concerned citizens, a lot of fear and emotion connected to those calls. And what we learned is it's really good to get in front of these things, no surprise. So we've since put out press releases and social media posts. We updated our website and we've got 
a new system with the hotline to kind of redirect those calls so that more and more people are getting their information, not through the hotline, which really is for true emergency uh, scenarios, but trying to direct them more to our website. I also wanted to share this really cool video with you and I'm gonna talk through it since we're on the topic of early detection and rapid response. All right, I think that's working. So this is a great example of what our staff do on a fairly regular basis. We get these calls through the hotline or through some other mechanism and we coordinate a rapid response to go get that animal out of the wild. So in this situation, we've got a biologist who's now backing out of a drainage pipe with a hand captured Asian water monitor that was reported. So we couldn't have done this without obviously Edward who's pictured here, he's about to grin ear to ear because he's thrilled that he just hand caught this thing. But we couldn't have done this without our staff partnering and coordinating with local law enforcement and in this case, um, Venom One in Miami-Dade County. So this actually ended up being a gravid female and we are fortunate that Edward et al. were able to get her out of the wild before she laid those eggs. So for priority non-native species that have established or breeding populations, our staff regularly, regularly survey for, trap, or otherwise remove these species from the wild using a variety of tools and techniques. We also work closely with communities to try to empower homeowners to remove those species when they're on their property. We also contract with private trappers, environmental firms and the like to conduct regular removal efforts on public lands. One of the long-standing components of our program at FWC is the Freshwater Fisheries Annual Electrofishing Assessment that occurs in urban canals of South Florida. Staff sample those canal systems uh, year-round throughout the month of October, and we monitor for the presence of new invasive fish. We also sample more natural water bodies in different parts of the state and respond to priority observations of invasive freshwater fish when they arise. In one recent example, staff did coordinate a rapid response with FWC law enforcement to investigate reports of what we thought at the time was a piranha uh, that had been released into a water body by, I'll just call them an Instagram influencer. Uh, sampling that waterway thankfully resulted in no piranha, but we did catch a similar looking species called Paku. And so we removed as many of those as we could. Uh, we also partner with other divisions within our agency to conduct research on species of interest, such as the bullseye snakehead. That's what's pictured here. And the snakehead species is prohibited in the state, but has established populations in several canal systems in South Florida. A uh, little is known about the snakehead and its impacts. So we're currently implementing a project to understand their movements, distribution, habitat preferences, and potential impacts like their diet on native sport fish. So the image here shows two of our staff conducting a gastric lavage to determine what that snakehead had been eating. So that's an ongoing project, you know, more um, final details to come, but preliminary results are showing that they have, no surprise, a much broader diet than some of our native fish and our, our um, sport fish. So in one particular example, I believe they removed, it was either a black racer or a water snake from the gut of a snakehead. So they're even taking terrestrial species, which is fascinating. Nile monitors are another high priority species that our staff regularly address. This is a carnivorous lizard that's not native to Florida and were introduced from Africa via the pet trade. They have since established at least two breeding populations, one in Lee County and the second in Palm Beach. And this species tends to be very closely associated with water and is often found near canal systems or other small water bodies. In Lee County, our staff work closely with the city of Cape Coral and local residents to set game cameras and live traps to try to catch and remove Nile monitors. In Palm Beach County though, we take a slightly different approach. We actually partner closely with the University of Florida and local water management districts to survey our canal systems by boat. And when we see a Nile monitor, we actually remove that animal on site real time with a firearm, but of course only if it's safe to do so. And you can see how many of these Nile monitors have been removed over the years. And as mentioned previously, tegus of course have known adverse impacts to Florida's native wildlife. They're another high priority for us. And again, have at least four breeding populations in the state. 
Uh, we work with contractors and university partners and many of our other state and federal partners as well to address these populations. As of March 2021, over 10,000 tegus have been removed from across the state. It's kind of incredible in a bad way. Um, in late 2017, though, our staff began receiving multiple reports from a community in Punta Gorda indicating that an emerging tegu population had been detected. So we moved quickly and we've been entrapping in that area with help from the local residents since they, those first reports started coming in. Collectively to date, we've removed over probably at this point, 183 tegus and unfortunately dozens of other non-native reptile species that are likely associated with a facility in the nearby area. And no surprise, another high priority for us, of course, is the Burmese python. Uh, not just priority for us, also our partners are addressing pythons all the time where they're established in South Florida. The species was first documented in 1979, just outside Everglades National Park, and has since established a breeding population across our vast natural areas in the southern part of the state. They're impacting native wildlife by consuming a broad array of prey items, including mammals, birds, and reptiles. And again, a variety of control tools are being implemented in the field or tested for refinement to improve our ability to detect and remove pythons as they are incredibly hard to find. You can see from the picture here how it could blend into its surroundings. Several land managers use python detection dogs in particular in the field, including the Miccosukee Tribe of Indians and the US Fish and Wildlife Service. FWC now also has a python detector dog team that became operational in October of last year. We've got two dogs trained now to detect Python scent. Truman, who is a black lab, is pictured here with his handler, and Eleanor, a point setter, who you're gonna see in a minute. They search public lands where pythons are known to exist about five days a week. And the team recently found his first python in December, 2020, and they continue to work on refining their skills. So this team is really comprised of let me get this video to play one second. A handler, and that is Paula. Here's Eleanor, our point setter. And Paula's getting Ellie ready to go. So once she's all harnessed up out into the field, they go. And this was just a training demonstration video. So pardon the, the jumpiness here, but it kind of gives you an idea of what the dogs are doing. So the handler that we've contracted with through JNK K9 train both dogs on python scent through a variety of techniques. So once the dog alerts to the handler that, hey human, there's a python here, the dog is pulled away because of course the dog's safety is priority number one. Here's Ellie with her first python find. And then at that point, our FWC biologist steps in to locate the python and hand catch it and get it out of the wild. So it truly is a team effort. Now here you can see Truman getting all harnessed up, ready to go. And off they go looking for more pythons. So these dogs are really driven by a reward. And as you can see from some of those photos and footage earlier, that reward is that little ball. So as soon as they find a python, they get that reward. So in addition to staff efforts, like I mentioned, FWC also contracts with partner agencies, universities, and even private individuals and companies to also remove non-native fish and wildlife from the environment. And the message here is we can't do it alone, no surprise. So today I'm going to just focus on one of these um, current projects, and that's our Python Removal Contractor Program. So back in spring 2017, FWC and the South Florida Water Management District decided to create this program. Prior to that, people could get a no-cost permit to essentially volunteer their time to remove pythons, but that system really wasn't working. So we had gotten additional support from the legislature that year through our budget to expand upon the use of contractors. And so we took that to heart and implemented that um, approach. So now we compensate almost 100 local python hunters to survey for catch and remove pythons from public lands across South Florida, including FWC and district managed lands, Everglades National Park, Big Cypress, Loxahatchee National Wildlife Refuge, and four additional state parks. Across agencies, our programs are essentially interchangeable. We pay contractors the same amount, they have the same access, 
They have almost identical terms and conditions within their contracts. And we regularly meet with our partners at the district to calibrate on our program operations. Since this program started, these contractors have removed probably well over 7,000 pythons at this point. When I put this together, it was just shy of 7,000, but every day that number is increasing because they are so productive and so busy. They're paid an hourly rate for their survey time, and they also get an additional fee if a python is captured, and that little graphic at the bottom of your screen kind of outlines what that looks like. So for every python four feet or below, the contractor is paid $50. They're paid an additional $25 for every foot beyond that. So if you catch many pythons like a nest, or I shouldn't say a nest, but a whole bunch of hatchlings um, or a very large python like is pictured here, that's a decent payday for these contractors. And I just wanted to point out too, this is kind of a cool image. This is an FWC and a district contractor team that work together all the time. And back in, I believe it was December of last year, they caught this 18 foot nine inch python, which was incredible. That is officially the largest python that has been removed from the state of Florida. And like I mentioned, this program really has seen considerable success since 2017 when the district and FWC launched these programs to pay experienced citizens to remove pythons. The number of captured pythons per year increased dramatically. And I hope that you can see this graphic kind of illustrates that point. It's hard to say exactly how um, effective this program is, and we're working on some of that right now with University of Florida, but you can definitely see a dramatic increase in the number of removals over time. So to date, over 12,000 pythons have been removed statewide by all efforts over time. And again, about 7,000 of those came just from this contractor program. So the FWC also supports the development and refinement of innovative tools and technologies to enhance our ability to again, detect and remove non-native invasive fish and wildlife. And currently our team is partnering with several universities to conduct research on risk assessment of several species of interest, habitat suitability modeling, data analysis for the contractor program and development of a really cool thing called a near infrared camera that ultimately will be mounted to a vehicle to aid in the search for the Burmese Python. So don't ask me all the nitty gritty details because I am not the PhD candidate who's working on this, but this image gives you at least a little bit of an example of what this would look like. So the camera again is mounted to the top of a vehicle. It stands about 11 feet high and really increases the field of view that the searchers, the visual human searchers can see. It will also help the searchers because this image that pops up of the Python really jumps out. And you can see that here, how it pops out against its um, environment. So this pro all these projects are still in the works, still have a lot of refinement and field testing before we finalize them. But ultimately our agency will end up with two of these near infrared cameras to mount to either our vehicles or contractor vehicles. So we're really excited about that. Hey Sarah, quick question on your previous slide. Um, someone asked what caused the spike in 2020 in the Python uh, removal program? Oh, great question. So in Late 2019, uh, Governor DeSantis uh, had held a press conference and he was incredibly supportive of the states and all of our partners' efforts to combat Burmese pythons, but he wanted to see us do more. So at that time, he directed FWC and the district to double the contractor program in size. So we essentially hired close to twice as many people to be part of this as we had in years prior. So that's probably part of the reason why. And just like anyone, the more you do this work, the better you get at it. So I think some of that might also come from experience as well. Good question. All right, and as I mentioned um, many times, we certainly cannot do our work without support from our partners and certainly the public. In fact, the FWC encourages interested members of the public to become part of our solution and regularly engages uh, 
with us on invasive species removal efforts. And I've listed a couple of those different options for the public here. We don't have enough time to get into all of them, but we do offer a variety of these opportunities. So the one I wanted to highlight today is this executive order 2017. As I'm sure you all know, non-native species are not protected in Florida except by anti-cruelty laws. And the FWC supports the public's um, efforts to catch and humanely kill non-native species on private lands wherever they have landowner permission and of course are using legal and humane methods. But again, in 2017, as part of our expansion, uh, we removed regulatory barriers by issuing this executive order that authorized the lethal take of any non-native reptile on, at the time, 22 commission managed lands in South Florida. And I just got a screenshot of that EO right here. No hunting license or permit is required to conduct these types of activities. There are no reporting requirements and there are no bag limits. We really just want people to feel empowered that if they happen to come across a non-native reptile that they should know they are legally allowed to kill it on site. And in 2020, this EO was updated to include three additional properties, one of which was Big Cypress. And of course, all area specific rules and regulations must still be followed, but it's been uh, really great to have that in place as part of our public engagement. Okay, now we're gonna shift gears a little. So that's a little bit about what our program does on a day-to-day -day kind of basis. So now I'm gonna to talk to you a bit more about our recent regulatory changes for high-risk reptiles. And I'm gonna to try to walk through this in a chronological fashion. So if at any time it gets uber confusing, please just shout out and let me know. So in July of 2020, FWC staff presented our first draft rule changes to the commission that proposed adding 16 high-risk non-native reptiles to the state's prohibited list. The commission approved our staff recommendations and directed us to engage heavily with stakeholders on the draft language. The primary goal of the rule package is to eliminate commercial breeding and pet ownership by reducing possession allowances for those 16 species. So during the latter part of 2020, staff worked closely with representatives from all kinds of stakeholder perspectives, including commercial industry, exhibitors, humane interest and environmental groups, land managers, and members of the public to refine the draft that had been approved by the commission in July. As part of this process, FWC contracted with Florida State University's Consensus Center to help us further engage with our stakeholders. So we created an online survey series that sought input on all parts of the rule, a virtual workshop series where members of the public could call in and offer their input and feedback on the draft. And then we also held three focus groups to further refine the final draft of the language. We uh, advertised these extensively through a news release, social media, a website, a targeted iHeart Media campaign, Gov delivery notifications, and through various additional individual meetings with some of these stakeholders. So most of the public comments that we received were very polarized with either stakeholders in full opposition or full support of the draft language. Uh, most members of the public, land managers, researchers, and members of humane interest groups were supportive of the proposed changes while most members of the reptile industry were either in opposition to some or all components of the proposed changes. Staff, regardless of stakeholder perspective, took all feedback from all stakeholders into consideration to develop our final rule that went to the commission just this past February. So on February 25th, of this year, the FWC commissioners unanimously approved our final rule changes to chapter 68-5 Florida Administrative Code. And again, that's our non-native species rule chapter. So where did we land? The final rules add 16 non-native species to the state's prohibited list, more specifically high-risk reptiles, and limits possession of these animals to research public exhibition. Prohibited species cannot be kept as pets or for commercial sales. However, this rule package, again, because of all of the stakeholder input we received, included 
quite a bit of limited exceptions and identified a new type of permit for prohibited species called an eradication and control permit. And right now we're going through the administrative process kind of behind the scenes to get all of the notices of change and final rule adoptions filed in the Florida Administrative Register. So we don't have an official effective date of the rule changes yet. So stay tuned on that. But as long as everything goes swimmingly, we're looking at possibly end of April as the earliest that these new rules could go into effect. So of course, a major component of the new rules was adding these 16 high-risk species of non-native reptile to the state's prohibited list. And as you can see, it applies to all the species here, including the um, large constrictors and Nile monitor, all of which were previously listed as conditional, as well as green iguanas and all species of tegu in the two genera that are listed here. Okay, so now I'm gonna to try to break down some of the details of this rule change package, kind of by user group, if you will. So prohibited status does not allow for people to keep these animals as pets. However, people who own pet green iguanas or tegus prior to their listing as prohibited will be allowed to keep their pets with a no cost permit from the state. No additional pet green iguanas or tegus can be acquired with this type of permit and they will need to mark their animals with pit tags and of course adhere to any biosecurity requirements that are also in rule. And per the norm, if anyone wishes to surrender their animal to the state, they can always do that for help finding it a new home through the FWC's exotic pet amnesty program. Now the prohibited status has and will continue to allow for research and public exhibition of these high risk species for certain qualifying entities that have a permit from the FWC. For the sake of time, I'm not gonna dive into the minor changes that were made to the research provisions, but if we just look at public exhibition permit eligibility, not everyone currently conducting exhibition with green iguanas or tegus will qualify under the new rules. So what we did was we included a limited exception for those entities that are currently conducting exhibition with green iguanas or tegus that will qualify for a new limited exception permit. This new rule offers exceptions, but disallows breeding of green iguanas or tegus for the purposes of exhibition. So really, again, we're trying to get these animals ultimately out of the state. The new rules also set minimum public exhibition requirements for all permitted entities that will be listed as 12 engagements per year, totaling 48 cumulative hours. Mobile exhibition is also going to be allowed with prohibited species, again, for those entities with the proper permits, but the animals must remain contained in their locked enclosure if they're outdoors and no public contact will be authorized. And you can see an example of what that might look like here. Prohibited status also does not allow for the sale of high risk species. So currently licensed entities will no longer be allowed to breed or sell the large constrictors or the Nile monitor, again, all of which were previously listed as conditional. And there's a grace period built into this rule already that allows them within a 90 day period after the rule becomes effective to come into compliance. So they essentially have to liquidate their inventories within that 90 day grace period. This rule change effectively eliminates commercial breeding and sales of the large snakes and the Nile monitor. But the new rule also phases out commercial breeding of tegus and green iguanas by June, 2024, previously licensed entities that engaged in commercial import export business with these lizards prior to the rule change may apply for a no cost permit to continue selling their stock as long as the permit remains valid. But importation of these species is no longer going to be allowed and breeding of these species for the purposes of sale must stop again by June, 2024. This three year sunset timeframe will allow these entities who have been in business with green iguanas or tegus to shift to less risky species while still allowing them to sell wild caught green iguanas or tegus through the new eradication and control permit in addition to the sales permit that they should have. 
sales will only be authorized to go out of state or in state to other appropriately permitted entities. And of course, if they're selling any of these things out of state or out of country, they will need all the additional permits and licenses required by various states or federal government. So removing high risk non-native fish and wildlife from the environment is obviously a very high priority for FWC. And we want to continue to support those efforts by our partner agencies and private trappers, et cetera. The rule changes incorporate a new permit type called eradication control permit that will authorize live transport of captured prohibited species to off-site facilities for the purposes of humanely killing them in a discreet fashion. Oftentimes like an HOA or a, a member of the public will hire a trapper to catch let's say iguanas on their property but they might not want to see them be killed. So this permit type will authorize those trappers to move those animals to again a discrete location so that they can euthanize them out of the public eye. If those animals that are trapped ultimately are going to be killed on site and not transported live, it's likely that they will not need this type of permit. Additional biosecurity provisions were also added as part of this rule package for prohibited reptiles. Outdoor caging must have two inch concrete flooring, four foot high concrete walls, have a closed top, include landscaping and development of the corners of the enclosure that prevent escape and must include a double door locked safety entrance. And we took a lot of that, um, those specific caging provisions directly from our venomous reptile rule. All prohibited animals housed outdoors must also be permanently marked with a pit tag and no breeding or rearing of these species can occur outdoors. Entities impacted by the rule changes will have again 90 days to come into compliance after the effective date of the new rules. And an additional 180 day grace period was also added by the FWC commissioners to allow people more time to come into compliance with the new outdoor caging requirements. In some cases, this will be a major overhaul for certain facilities. So we wanted to make sure we allow them enough time to make those changes to come into compliance. So that certainly doesn't cover absolutely every part of the most recent rule changes, but I think it covers um, the vast majority. And as you can tell, it's a bit confusing perhaps. <laughs> it's certainly multifaceted but ultimately is going to prevent new introductions and establishment of those 16 high-risk non-native reptiles in our state. So our next steps are to implement these rule changes as soon as we know the effective date and get the word out to the public. We've already created a website and you can access it through the URL that's listed here. That website includes information for those different user groups, links to new permit applications, and a huge series of FAQs. We're also working on an outreach and communications plan to promote compliance with the new rule changes through various social media platforms, so more on that later. But that's not where our work ends. Uh, the commissioners also approved staff recommendations to move forward with the development of a TAG or technical assistance group that will engage stakeholders and the FWC to discuss current regulatory framework and risk determination for non-native species in trade. So if you have any questions or need to direct someone where they can find more information on these new rules, please direct them to our website. There's a banner at the top of the page that provides a link to our rule change website and it's got a lot of really helpful information. And the last thing I wanted to cover today before I completely wrap up, uh, this you see here a bullet pit tagging events, what's that? Well, that's something we are moving forward with at FWC, I'm really excited about it. Um, as you saw, you know, pet owners will now have to pit tag their green iguanas and tegus. And what we heard from our stakeholders during the public comment period was that that could be very cost prohibitive, prohibitive. Sometimes veterinarians don't offer that service for reptiles. And so we are going to work with partners, hopefully AZA accredited facilities and volunteer veterinarians to offer a couple events across the state. We're thinking one per FWC region details to be determined, where we actually provide pit tags and pit tagging services through those veterinarians for those pet owners. It would be no cost. 
Um, it would be, hopefully, anyway, the idea is to be really simple and straightforward. They'd have their PIT tagging complete, and then it would be another way to get additional information out to our regulated public, as well as promoting compliance with the rule change. So that's what I have for you guys today. Thank you so much for bearing with me. That was a very long presentation, and I will certainly be happy to open it up to any questions. Thank you, Sarah. That was just long but necessary. Um, so much to go through there. We do have a few questions coming in on the chat, so I'll just kind of start going through them. Um, first question that came in, is there a plan, or I would add even concern, to deal with the potential uh, illegal releasing of some of these reptiles that may happen for dealers or breeders to become compliant? Yeah, that's a great question. So we are definitely on high alert to be on the lookout for those reports. And I think what we really plan to do is promote compliance through all those different mechanisms that were listed. Certainly if somebody is doing something illegal per the norm, our law enforcement agency could cite them for a violation. Sometimes it can be tricky to trace that back to an owner. So we're hoping that you know through all of our stakeholder engagement that we've developed some really positive relationships with folks. But yeah, the more we can get the word out to people about all of the no cost permits that they can obtain, hopefully the more we can prevent that kind of thing from happening. Great, next question. Um, does FWC have any regulatory restrictions, permits for handling breeding or resale of other venomous or non-native organisms like um, arthropods, like tarantulas or scorpions that are often sold alongside these reptiles? Yeah, that's another great question. That's actually uh, regulated, I think, primarily through FDAX. I don't know if anybody from FDAX is on the call today, but they might be able to add something to the chat. Yeah, we can follow up. Um, so yeah, if you have any other questions for Sarah, um, feel free to uh, hop in the chat or um, you're also welcome to unmute. Um, I have a, a number of updates for you guys. And actually, Sarah, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit and see if you have any additional information. Um, let me get my screen shared. So I've got a number of updates um, from the FISMA side. And I wanted to start with just some news, um, some recent news that has come up. So, um, and I'm going to throw a link in the um, chat box. So just to make sure everyone on the call um, kind of has gotten this information. Um, if you are unaware, there was a recent issue related to zebra mussels being found in these moss balls that go out in the pet trade um, for aquariums. And so these zebra mussels were detected in these moss balls and have been found now in a number of states, including Florida. So I popped in the chat box here a link to FWC's response page for this, as well as the US Fish and Wildlife Service response page for this. So there's currently a federal effort, a uh, coordinated effort going on to work with the um, pet stores that may have these in stock. Um, I know that's happening on the federal and statewide level. Um, and then, um, so there's that. And then also there's been a story going around and getting a lot of play about Florida's newest invasive species, uh, river monster fish, uh, an arapaima, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, so I wanted to share really quickly and FISP did a social media post on this last week. Um, as far as I know, and again, I'll ask Sarah or really anyone else on the call if they have any additional information, but as far as I know, um, there has been one dead fish found. And um, so the hope is that currently this is a single uh, uh, isolated uh, event and there's no evidence of a breeding population. So definitely a cause for vigilance and being aware. But um, I think some of the press stories have made it sound like there have been dozens of these things found, um, which is not currently the case. Um, Sarah, do you have anything to add on either of those issues? Just wanted to give you that opportunity. Sure, I'm glad you brought this up. So yeah, two really uh, high priority events happened in the past couple of weeks, like you mentioned here. So I'll start with zebra mussels. Um, right now, we're really following suit with all the other agencies, whether they be state agencies or federal agencies across the nation, just trying to get the word out to people that if you have a moss ball, it might be infected with zebra mussels. And here's how you decontaminate, excuse me, decontaminate that product and or your aquarium. So the more people can share links to the websites, whether they be Florida specific FWC website, or even some of the more national um, information on decontamination strategies, I believe US Fish and Wildlife Service was lead on that, the better. Um, our law enforcement have done a ton of work with our federal partners 
to address the two distributors that were located in Florida. And also, I think they actually visited all the individual buyers of those product that came directly from those distributors. So our law enforcement is doing a ton of work to try to get these product or this product off of shelves and help us get the word out to decontaminate. So um, thanks for sharing our website on that one, Emily. And as far as Arapaima is concerned, yeah, this is a really weird one. We've actually gotten a couple reports of Arapaima in the very recent past, some that were many years old and we don't know how legitimate they are. Um, some were recent and yes, we did recover one Arapaima fish body, which was incredibly decomposed and super gross. So props to my staff for dealing with that. But um, we're looking into it now. That actually was a pit tagged animal. And so there's an ongoing investigation. So I can't say much more than that. But we're also working with our federal partners right now to put together a proposal to see if we can do a little bit more rapid response and possibly even develop Arapaima specific eDNA, look at habitat suitability and things of the like. Great, thank you. Okay, um, so yeah, keep those those questions coming in. I'm gonna um, give a few more updates here, uh, and I'm gonna throw some links, just a whole list of links in the chat box um, as I go through these updates. Um, so let's see, moving on. Um, so I wanted to give a quick uh, wrap up kind of uh, information on the stay at home read wrangle campaign we did in the month of February. Um, so hopefully you saw uh, either via email or on our social media that in coordination with National Invasive Species Awareness Week, we hosted this stay at home weed wrangle um, in lieu of in-person events as we're still kind of figuring out this whole or, or finding the light at the end of the pandemic tunnel. Um, and so we had a campaign where we had prizes for folks who would um, remove invasive species from their property and fill out our really brief survey and then send before and after pictures of their work. And so we had 65 persistent uh, participants statewide across 23 counties. Um, so, and I think that's a really great start. Um, and um, and I want to make sure that we acknowledge Invasive Plant Control Incorporated, a company out of Nashville, Tennessee, that I think many of you are familiar with, um, who stepped up and volunteered uh, our are uh, donated 10 weed wrench tools as prizes and giveaways. So what we had to give away for participants were 10 of these weed wrench tools. We also, um, via our partnership with the Weed Wrangle program, had 10 sets of uh, gardening gloves to give away. And then we also um, had some native plant gift certificates donated to give away. So I'm in the process of pulling together all the data as well as uh, um, sending out the prizes. Uh, we've notified everybody who won a prize and we're getting those out to them. Um, so at our next, um, at our upcoming workshop, which I'll talk about in a minute, I'll, I'll share more information on that. But um, really quickly, you know, for the month of February, we uh, did this kind of uh, focused social media, focused our social media on this effort, and we had a lot of traction there. So again, um, next week at our workshop, I'll share a little more of the, the stats on that, but we put together these kind of resources and, and had a lot of traction and a lot of shares uh, and a lot of views on this, these, um, these resources that we, we shared. So really quickly to save the date, um, there is another NISA in 2021, part two, outreach and education. That'll be May 15th through 22nd. Um, I don't have any major uh, plans right now. Kind of what we did last year was we just encouraged everybody to do a little bit of extra um, outreach and education focused around NISA. Um, so I'll probably set, I'll try to get something out to SISMA folks um, just to kind of uh, coordinate what we may do. Um, but at, at this time, no, no main focus or anything just yet. Um, if you do, if your SISMA typically does, um, uh, uh, declarations like National Invasive Species Week declarations with your county or cities, this is a great time to uh, to do that. And then for Weed Wrangle 2022, so looking ahead to next year, um, go ahead and save the dates for February 21st through 27th. Again, this will be in line with that National Invasive Species Awareness Week that occurs in the last week of February. Um, hopefully at this time we'll be able to return to encouraging volunteer events, but I think um, we actually we want to also continue hosting a stay at home uh, volunteer effort um, because of the success of this year and because it encourages people to work in their own landscapes. Um, so one thing I'm kind of hoping to do and I think would be fun is to frame it in a way that has kind of a fun competition between the SISMAs, potentially both in their amount of 
physical in-person volunteers, but as well as their uh, number of volunteers who uh, participate in the stay at home effort. And so one of the things that I will get out to uh, CISMA leads via email is I'll send you the spreadsheet of um, people who participated in the stay at home we wrangle so you can kind of see the breakdown by county. Um, again, we had a, a pretty good spread across the state, but definitely some, some regional gaps. So next week, uh, hopefully you have received information about this and potentially already registered, but we are hosting, um, well, we have our spring FISP meeting. So the Florida Invasive Species Partnership meets twice a year um, in spring and fall. And this is typically our, uh, this is kind of our steering committee. So our partners, um, but it is an open meeting. Uh, so we'll be meeting from 9.30 to 12 and there's your agenda. We're also hosting our CISMA workshop on that same day. So as you know, in the past, our CISMA workshop typically occurs with the Florida Exotic Pest Plant Council, now the Florida Invasive Species Council's um, annual conference. Unfortunately, that has been canceled uh, last year and this year due to COVID. Um, so last year we didn't have a CISMA workshop and this year we're gonna host virtually from one to 3 p.m. on, um, let's see, I didn't put the date on there, did I? <laughs> so that's Tuesday, March 30th. Um, again, hopefully you've received the emails. If you're not getting notifications of these things, just let me know. We'll make sure you get, get on that list. Um, so that's Tuesday, March 30th. And the link to register is in the chat box. Um, so you just need to register and you'll get an email for how to participate in that. And so our focus there on the CISMA workshop, uh, first and foremost, to get updates from the CISMA and get reacquainted with our leadership. We've had a number of uh, a number of CISMA lead turnovers over the last year or so. And so we want to kind of introduce our new leads um, and, and thank our, our outgoing leads. Um, and then also we're going to be just providing some focusing on kind of uh, how to host virtual events, some tips and tricks, and also the CEUs that um, are available in Florida to offer for, uh, for different events. So don't forget to register. And I'm looking forward to talking with everybody then. Um, I wanted to highlight there's there's just a lot going on in the spring. Spring is typically a busy time for us. Um, so we've got a lot more events happening. Um, definitely check out our calendar online, um, which there is also a link to in the chat box um, for a full listing. But I wanted to highlight these two upcoming events um, on March 31st through April 1st. Um, NASMA is hosting an EDMAP summit with uh, our friend Chuck Bargeron. And um, this looks like a really good program. So if you just need a refresher on EDMAPs or you wanna know what they've been doing, uh, they've been doing a lot of work updating their tools and products, um, definitely check that out. And then um, for the month of, or for the month of April through mid-May, um, there's gonna be an Aquatic Plant Management Summit hosted by the US IFIS, UF IFAS Center for Aquatic and Invasive Plants. Um, and so the schedule here for that is on the side there. And um, the links to both of these are also in the chat box. Um, and so you can check those out. But these events are both on our calendar as well as there's a lot more going on. So this isn't everything, but I did just wanna highlight these two, uh, these two programs that are coming up. Uh, sorry, I know I'm talking really fast. I've got a few more minutes here. So um, our upcoming uh, call schedule, um, I'm really excited about our next couple months of calls. Um, next month, we're actually gonna hear from Dave Coyle uh, with Clemson about something that isn't in Florida yet, but whose range is expanding, which is the Asian longhorn beetle. So uh, in South Carolina, they currently have an eradication program going on um, as this is a new invasion for them. So this is kind of a be on the lookout. Um, let's learn more about this pest so we know what to be aware of. Um, in May, we're gonna get an update on laurel wilt in Florida in the Southeast from Jeff Eichwart with FDAX. And then in June, uh, we're gonna get a, um, a briefing on a, a recent publication uh, regarding outreach of invasive species and the terminology that we use uh, to communicate around that. So really excited about uh, the upcoming quarters CISMA calls. Um, again, thank you everybody for joining us today. Let me just check uh, if you have any questions, um, comments about any of this, uh, please reach out anytime. Um, as these calls are recorded, so they can be um, found at, on our website. And then um, also please just follow us on social media. We've, you know, we've been really making an effort to, uh, to ramp that up and, and put good products out there. So um, the links to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter are also in the chat box. 
And I think I am right on our 2.30 minute mark. So uh, yeah, it, thank you again, everybody. Thank you, Sarah, um, for that great presentation. Again, just really uh, important to be aware of that program and, uh, and the work that they're doing. Um, uh, so much good stuff going on. So uh, thanks, everybody. Have a really wonderful rest of your week. And I'm looking forward to talking again with many of you next Tuesday. <laughs> uh, have a great one.